my name is John Lauer, I'm Director of the Tees Manager Joint Trustee Unit and Chief Executive of the Tees Manager Partnership and I'm delighted to be uh, chairing this session which is about regeneration and the role of arts and culture and I think it's fair to say that when we were preparing the Tees Manager Vision, uh, one of the things that we were very interested in was the role that arts and culture could, ta could, could, could take place, that it could take in the issue of regeneration. And um, it's something that I know has been, they've been followed up, but it's probably something we need to probably increase greater focus on in the future. So I'm very interested to hear about some of the good, good areas of good practice which, uh, which we have today, and some good examples of good practice, where in fact culture and arts are contributing to regeneration. Um, the speakers are going to speak uh, one after the, for 10 minutes each, and I'm going to be quite strict on time, and I want to leave us with about uh, half an hour at the end for um, for discussion, so I'm going to be quite strict on that, so I give warning that's what we're going to do, because I want to hear what you want to say about the whole issue of regeneration and uh, culture and have a proper debate. So without more ado, can I welcome Trace Tiffinolte, who was the Head of Arts Services from London, London of Barking and Dagenham, who has been working on a particular project looking at professional artists working in regeneration, working with local community and regenerating local neighbourhoods on an artscapes project, on the 13 artscapes project. So Tracy, over to you. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, just to give some context, you should have all have picked up one of the booklets that we've got inside, and that gives the full background on the A13 project. Um, there's also a DVD in there so you get the in situ experience. Um, it started life in 96, 97, basically a strategy to improve the environment of the A13 as it cuts through Barking and Dagenham. That strategy developed into one of what was then the biggest public art project in the country, and succeeded in achieving the biggest arts lottery grant for the public arts at the time. It's been superseded by uh, not so far from here as it happens uh, for the public arts scheme. But um, basically I'm going to um, just talk about, um, uh, basically I'm just going to talk about some of the reasons why we did the project and what we think that the artists have brought to it. But I would just, shall I come up with that? well-being of the communities and also how those communities perceive themselves, how travellers through Barking and Dagenham perceived the place as a road that took you through somewhere you didn't want to be in order to get to somewhere where you did want to be. And there was no sense of arrival in Barking and Dagenham, no sense of location and no sense that this was a place where people lived, where people cared about, where people invested in. So the project basically sort of, um, sought to address that. We appointed a lead artist who's actually a qualified architect. His name is Tom Dupuer, and he devised an overall scheme for the road, which was about uh, introducing some uniformity, about looking at the landscaping, about looking at access, about introducing things like cycles and footpaths. And then along that way, how you can involve artists in creating more statement interventions. This is the area we're dealing with. This is as the roadworks were being undertaken. We implemented the project as part of Transport for London's A13 Road Improvement Programme. I leave this slide here because I think it's important to, to show the scale that we're actually dealing with. We're talking about artists affecting these kind of spaces to the benefit of the community. I think what's important to note is that, in my experience, the artists don't regenerate existing communities. What they do is add an essential ingredient, and that essential ingredient is some creativity and flair, and that flair allow some risks to be taken that move away from the standard treatments that save the contractors money or get the best and the cheapest job as far as the contract is concerned and it's about what really changes the perception of an area and indicates that it's for people to use and it's about scale and one of the things that we've sought to do through the artist in intervention 
is address that scale so that these spaces become more human, they become more usable, that people can actually move through them without being secondary to a road or a commuter. I don't remember to breathe when I speak. This is one of the landscaped areas on the A13 that's introduced cycling footpaths and lighting and earthworks on what was previously a very barren wasteland that had just burned out cars, flight had been, people just dumping any old rubbish that they could think of on there because they could drive on it right off the A13 and back on. Now what you don't see on the other side of the cycle path is people's houses, people's gardens, and that's what they were facing directly under the A13. This is part of the same area. But one of the projects I'm specifically going to focus on, uh, one of which is this small shopping parade, where the artists were involved in re-landscaping an area that was deemed no man's land, even though the people lived there and had to look down on this. It was a place that people just congregated, young people congregated, and social behaviour, and really no sense of space or place and turned it into an area that had some sort of functionality for the people in the area that now sit out and use it. But I think one of the most successful projects are our two subways. And this subway uh, is the old subway. This is what I think is an example of a great subway. Right opposite people's houses. Those people's houses were nice gardens, well maintained, and this is their local amenity. And it sends out a very strong, clear message to that community. And the artist then worked to really get to the heart of the character of the place and establish what people wanted in the environment. And the result was this, after the artist's intervention. And I think it really demonstrates that you can completely change the perception of an area through you know, artists working directly with civil engineers, working with people like me, and consulting with the community in order to make these things a reality. The contractor would have done this. The contractor would have just gone in, changed the lights, swept the floor, and said, right, fine, we've done the survey refurbishment. And this is what the interior looks like now. The flooring is resin with fiber optic, and the lighting runs through a sequence band, <coughs> banded lighting. And I'd just also like to make a point, we do run all our projects through the access team as well. So there's no danger at all of them causing any problems anyone with any visual or mobil mobility problems. And that's, you know, the, these people using these, and those kids look happy. And it looks much better now, in my opinion. And I hope you think it does too. Mm -hmm. And the artist designed all the fencing, all the walkways. This is one of our statement features, but I'll skip through this, because this is just about creating a remarkable context, if you like, for the projects. <coughs> that have more local resonance. Now this is moving on. PowerPoint's not moving on. We just sort out the PowerPoint because I think one of the best ways to illustrate to you what I'm actually trying to convey, which is that the artists have created places as opposed to allowing the local authority planning uh, team and the contractors to come up with a functional amenity, is the only way to really show that is, is through the pictures. But I think one of the things that I think is most successful about the project is that it didn't try and might have tried to in the early days. I was involved then, so it's easy for me to say that. But I don't believe that it tried to do this statement of, well, this is a piece of art, it's here, it must be recognised as art, and it must be untouchable as art. What we've attempted to do <coughs> is actually change the way places are used, enable movement to be much more coherent for local people, and really affect how that road impacted 
on the people that had to sit opposite, had to, had to live opposite her. You know, looking out your window and what you see are six, seven lanes of heavy moving traffic. It's been addressed by an arts project that has put in screens of trees, a fitting barriers, cycles and footpaths, new subways and green spaces. And people can come and look at it and say, that's not great art. And I'd say, well, maybe it's not great art, but it's good design and it's functional design and it's about where people live. And in doing that project, you've managed to create some very clear <coughs> functional spaces that also look really good and are used really well and aren't vandalised. We might get the odd kind of, you know, tentative tag in the corner. The strategy is we immediately go in, immediately clean it off, and it stops. Over the summer holidays, we might get the odd light smashed, we go in and we repair it. And that's a commitment as well to an arts project that we have had to sign up to. And if it hadn't been an arts project, we, ne we wouldn't necessarily have that same commitment because we wouldn't have had the same level of investment, we wouldn't have had the same monitoring criteria for the grant. So all in all, it, it, it's worked very well to ensure that the local authority sticks by what it's set out to do, which is improve that vicinity of the road. And I think it was quite a brave thing to do for the authority at the time. I think it was brave to not try and create a kind of landmark feature, to not bow to pressure to you know, do projects that were either solely community-based or solely arts-based, but to really try and, and, and combine the two of them. At a time in the 90s where there was a bit of misconception about what community art was, what public art was, we were riding on the wave of the whole 80s, corporate sector, public art commissioning. And community art really, I think, has become the avant-garde, if you like. It's the stuff that not many people are talking about, not many people are looking to fund, and it's the stuff that takes risks. And in doing that aspect of a major landscaping project that involved the community, we've got things that are going to last for a long time. We've got things that are going to have resonance on how people perceive the spaces where they live, the places where they live. And we move through them. We don't look, oh, well, this is obviously a poor area because it's got really run down subways and the fencing is falling apart and nobody's cutting the grass. It actually looks like people care about the place. And that, to me, has been worth all the millions of pounds that we invested in the project. How are we doing? Could I ask you just a question, Tracy, which, might, which is interesting, because one of the things that we, we suffer from from around here is that, um, is that if I ask, I, 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 we just recently been doing a sort of lighting scheme in Saltburn, which has been sort of, you know, doing all the tourism perspective. And whilst um, uh, the money we get, most of our money comes from one or fees to read or agency, and whilst we sort of say, um, you know, when they always say they're very keen to support cultural things and one thing to other, as soon as I get anything like this type of thing, which is we've been doing something similar with art and lighting at Salton, they, I get some crusty old quantitative air from one North East to come to tell me that this is a waste of money, it's not achieving anything, we well, always is just environment approval, what's this going to do for Salton? And that's the sort of attitude that I get. I'm interested to know that here you are working on the A13, prime part of London. Um, You've got the Department of Transport, who are not the most wonderful people to fund some of these things sometimes. Well, they can be a bit more, I know in London, because I've worked in London, a bit more, um, shall we say, up, up front for something different than perhaps it's they are down here. It was a lot of work. Yes, I can say, how do you manage to achieve that? How do you manage to do the, the, the funding part of it? The funding? Well, in terms of the funding from the Arts Council, that was brokered over a period of about a year with the um, Gardner. The funding made the Transport Board for London, to be fair, they wanted to do major road improvements in Bath and Dagenham, and we negotiated what's known as a Section 278 agreement. Some of you, probably all of you, might be familiar with one of six agreements which you pay to developers who are building housing and you want some money for local amenities, community arts, and so on. Um, the 278 applies to the highways. So they accepted our design and they implemented it all along the way. But the crucial ingredient in this project was having a civil engineer as the project manager who was totally signed up to the project. What we didn't have was an arts officer going along to the civil engineer and saying, oh, I've got this really nice idea to do some art. Will you help me? And I'm saying, oh, come on, I can't do that on a road. And it, it really changed the culture of working in Bath and Dagenham. So we had this whole department of engineers 
who had until then been working in such a way as to think that you couldn't do anything but what they said and what they proved could be maintained. Therefore, it had to come from a catalogue so they could reorder it if it got smashed and so on. Since we've done the A30 landscape, I've spoken a lot to the events like this. I've been interviewed on BBC London, which was even more nerve-wracking than this. And I have been in lots of journals and magazines, and it's had a massive impact on just that positive publicity and the constant drip, drip, drip. You know, you just can't, you just can't buy that sort of thing. So um, I would say, though, it would have been unachievable without an engineer as the project manager, because sitting across the table from the contractors, and they say, no, I can't do that, that's not going to work. Yes, you can. Yes, you can, and it will work. I'm running over time a lot. I'm going to show you one more picture. This, I'm just going to show you this one project, because I think it illustrates it brilliantly. This was the subway, as was, connecting an area of the borough that's completely isolated from the rest of the borough by the A13, by the industrial estate, back in Dagenham, well, well not everyone, but lots of people know Dagenham Fords, and the whole area as being an industrial area going down to the Thames. And this estate was just sat on the edge of that industrial area, cut off from the rest of the place by the A13, and this was their access point to get underneath the A13 into the rest of the borough. As you can see, struggling up the stairs, and this is what they walked through to get to that point. And there's the overview of it, as it was. And that's what it looks like since the artist got cracking on it. And what the artist didn't accept was that we were asking her to do a treatment to that scheme. And in her view, which was shared and supported by the engineer, by me, by the rest of us, you don't make a space like this more attractive by simply painting it, or oh, well, maybe you do make it more attractive, you do make it more user friendly, but you do when you do this. And we completely re landscape the whole area. It was enormously expensive, paid for completely by Transport for London after a lot of negotiation and political pressure, and involves terrace planting and level, foot level lighting and you know, just reinforcing the message with abuse. And this idea of hers was that you would descend into this Mediterranean garden, rediscover a bit of bark in the Dagenham's uh, Roman past as you went down there. And this is the other side. And as you can see, housing facing the A13. And that's what that looks like now. Obviously, that was just finished, the planting hasn't taken. And the interior, as it was, Quite a common subway design with a broken back and Pat completely, Pat Kaufman's the artist who worked on this and she redesigned it in terms of the lighting and the tiling so it'd be like finding some secret sort of underground passageway like going into the tube with some artworks on the walls and all these were done in consultation and with community workshops with the local estate. Um, this is the estate, that picture I showed you of them facing the A13 the council went and built a massive brick wall in front of the houses to shield them from the A13. So they were pretty, well, they were pretty happy that instead of looking out at the A13, they were now looking at a big brick wall. So the project enabled us to build this grass bank with planting and lighting. Um, and the uh, planting is on climbers that are detachable so that the wall can still be maintained. And then it climbs up and um, shields it with the lighting as well and planted head fields of hedges, cycles and footpaths, all artists designed, created some features, and we had an ongoing seven-year community arts program, which was also about environmental issues, about dance and theatre and arts installations, not all just about capital program and building things. And that's it, basically. But the, it does have a legacy. <coughs> it was so successful in terms of the community accepting it, and it wasn't easy. Communications were a really big issue for us, the community accepting it. And as a result, though, we are now doing a similar project as part of Barbian Home Centre Regeneration. Thanks, thanks very much, Tracy. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, thanks very much for, for that for an interesting and uh, thought-provoking presentation. The second uh, speaker is Ruben Kent, who's Head of Arts and Cultural Stocks and Tisborough Council.
and Rupert's going to talk about arcs and strategic planning and regeneration. Thanks. I'm going to try and uh, make up for a bit of the time that we lost to the technical uh, uh, technology um, by having the wonderful technology of some post-it notes, um, which probably won't go out of sequence or disappear on us. Um, I will try and keep it very, very brief, because I do think it's important that we have a conversation. Um, I, I think it was very useful to see those examples and, uh, and, and Tracy's uh, talked there about some of the principles that in any way, in any case, I was going to touch on, so that's useful. Who thinks, who in this room thinks um, arts and culture more broadly has a contribution to make to regeneration? A fair number of you, probably a pretty large majority. That's probably part of the way you're here. But you can't always assume that you're preaching to the converted. The role of, of um, arts in strategic planning and regeneration is, is firstly to make the case. And it isn't always the case which is readily accepted. And uh, as John referred there, you do still get the quantity surveyor uh, or the engineer who doesn't accept the case, uh, however persuasively you think you're making it. I think in terms of uh, the, the rege regeneration, we're talking about the case for culture rather than the case for the arts. We're talking about culture, perhaps culture with a small c, what one might call culture with a small c, the, the traits, characteristics, beliefs, uh, concerns that we share. Um, pride in who we are, willingness to strive for what we want, and, and preparedness to see things from different perspectives. Culture with a small C, but also culture with a large C, the, um, the, the arts, music, theatre, dance, literature, architecture, the institutions, the performers and the venues. Um, we're talking about culture with a small and large C contribution to regeneration. The context in the northeast of England and the Teeth Valley is a context of um, underlying characteristics, socio-economic characteristics of low levels of entrepreneurialism, low levels of educational attainment, low levels of aspiration, low levels of business startup, low levels of, uh, of, of business diversity. Uh, those underlying characteristics are ones which we have been arguing for some time, are ones which small c culture is fundamental in addressing and capital C culture is almost uniquely well placed to try and change. We do have a history in the North East and, and, it's, and it's, it's not coincidental that we're having this debate in the North East because we do have a history in the North East of using culture to change the uh, levels of aspiration, the levels of business growth, the levels of, of economic activity and the quality and, and uh, uh, confidence of communities. It, okay, it's the region of the angel. It's also the region uh, of, of the sage and of the music centre. And, and I think that what's, what's interesting about the, the, the collection of those being in, in Gateshead, not in Newcastle or even in Newcastle Gateshead with no gap in between, but in Gateshead, is because they're in a town that recognised that with the highest outflow of population of any town in the country, it needed to invest in cultural activity. And it did so to its massive transformation over time. We are in a fortunate position in the Tees Valley in the sense that um, not only do we the unfortunate position that we share those underlying characteristics of low aspiration uh, and low attainment and low business uh, birth rate, but we also uh, share the commitment. And whilst um, John talked about the difficulty of getting uh, some of the uh, one northeast um, bureaucrats to accept our outputs, we do nevertheless have, have uh, a Tees Valley vision which has always accepted the role of culture. And we have, for example, in, in Teeth Valley Regeneration, um, a, a, an organisation which is, which is committed to the role of, of the arts and culture. The chief executive of Teeth Valley Regeneration, Joe Doherty, uh, has described it as, as regeneration, sustainable regeneration is, is not about uh, roads, buildings and hard hats. It's about changing the culture in areas, it's about changing the narrative. And I think that's, um, in many ways, again, what Tracy was talking about in, in, in terms of of changing people's perceptions about an area, people's belief about the area from within that area. Strategically, if we're going to ensure that the arts and culture contribute to regeneration, we've got to embed it in people's thinking. And again, that's something which is easy to take for granted, easy to overlook or take as implicit. But we do have to embed it in people's thinking because it's only, it's only when the, the engineer or the quantity surveyor or the highways uh, engineer uh, or the architect, or the parks uh, person, or the, or the, or the uh, car parking uh, officers. It's only when those various institutions believe it that it becomes sustainable and, and deliverable. 
So it's a long-term uh, uh, initiative. And it is critical that we find evidence. If we are going to change practice and we are going to embed uh, a commitment to culture and cultural spend, not as spend on the arts per se, but as spend on achieving social and economic regeneration, as spend on achieving uh, vibrant uh, communities and quality of life, we do have to find evidence. And um, we're all, those of us who are unfortunate enough to be in, um, in, in local government or in other, uh, other areas of, of, of uh, the public sector, Finding evidence and, and, and finding performance indicators and measures is frustrating business because we're usually talking about uh, things that are, whilst being important, are hard to measure, and we operate in a world in which measurable things are important. But I did, I, I do want us to, I just wanted to end with with something. This relates particularly to economic regeneration and, cult and culture's contribution to that. But I think it does, it is useful, uh, and it inspires hope because it's from a body of work which points to evidence of the value of contribution of, 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 of creativity. And it's, uh, it's Richard Florida, an, uh, an American uh, professor of economics, who says that creativity, or the ability to create meaningful new forms, is the decisive source of competitive advantage, advantage in virtually every industry, from automobiles to fashion, food products, and information technology. The winners in the long term are those who can create and keep creating. Access to talented and creative people is to modern business what access to coal and iron ore was to steel making. And I hope that that makes us feel that whilst it might be difficult to persuade people of our value, we have an intrinsic value that we struggle to measure, but no one can deny is there. Thanks very much, Ruben. And uh, moving on to sort of from the strategic view, we're looking at uh, social enterprise next and what role that can take in uh, regenerating these values. And Cliff Southcombe, who was a social enterprise consultant for the UNC City Academy and the Community Action Network, is going to do a short presentation on that. Not quite, but almost. <laughs> Have we got a PowerPoint? I'm not too bothered if I have it. It will make, make three in a row for me that didn't, because I just had two seminars when the PowerPoint thankfully didn't work. <laughs> Shall we give up on the PowerPoint? I'll just start. Okay, right. okay. so um, so the first bit would have been the advert, you know, the, the name and the and the website and the telephone number. You can have all that later on. Um, I've, I've been asked to, uh, to speak for ten minutes on what is social enterprise, um, its impact <coughs> on the northeast, and also uh, a bit about relevance of art. So uh, I'll sort of skim through things as best I can. Um, if you're looking for what is social enterprise, the obvious place to start is now the government has the DTI uh, social enterprise unit, and uh, that has the DTI definition of social enterprise, which uh, I, I had sort of watered down a bit. But by and large, what they're talking about is social enterprise, in their terms, is about businesses that are, have social aims as well, um, and, and that they are trading organizations it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a straightforward definition, and it relates a lot to the government agenda about regeneration. Uh, not, not very inspiring, so we'll, we'll, we'll move on. Um, and for me, sort of social enterprise is, uh, oh yeah, we'll move on from that one quickly. <laughs> Good. Um, social enterprises, I, I think we've been working with them for some time, and there's a sort of shape that's emerging. One is that there are democratic organizations, there is this sort of term entrepreneurial, which is being uh, moved a lot, but it does mean that social enterprises perhaps differ from uh, public sector in so much that they are decision-making, risk-taking organizations. Um, something which I don't think the DTI uh, define enough, and that is that they are governed by social objectives. They're actually driven by social objectives. And, and there's, a, there's quite a school of thought that says that a social enterprise can't define the problem that it's trying to solve, then it isn't really a social enterprise because its main purpose is actually in solving people's problems. Um, and, and also, I, I run a course for uh, social enterprise managers that I've been for some time. And the thing that always happens when people start talking long enough, 
is that they stop talking about the activities, they stop talking about um, the, uh, the catering project or the green project or the minibus project, and they start talking about people and they talk about the changes to individuals. And that's, uh, and that's a very common theme, and sometimes I say it doesn't really matter what you're doing, what you have in common here. It doesn't really matter whether you're using minibuses or art or, um, or, or, or books or anything. The main thing that you have in common is that you are particularly concerned in changing people's lives. And, and that is, is good social enterprise. Yeah, can I have the next one? Oh, thanks. Uh, why social enterprise? There's, there's numerous reasons why social enterprise is happening and, and perhaps increasing. But I, I would define them into three areas. One is the one about regeneration. Um, and that is linked to communities, particularly from the north, trying to set up community businesses, community enterprises, to try and find their own solutions. And it is linked to, uh, to regeneration quite closely. And, and the danger is, is that we only see that as the role of social enterprise. A bit more controversially, I think there's a strong school of thought, particularly um, at number 10, that somehow business and, uh, um, and entrepreneurial practice is better. The more we can move things out into that sort of sphere uh, is better in terms of anything from hospitals to local authorities, everything. Uh, and so social enterprise has a role there in, in what's becoming a very common word, procurement. You'll find a procurement conference anywhere now. Uh, but also, one thing that they don't talk about, of course, is, is the fact that within social enterprise, there's a movement to see it as an alternative to the private sector, that there are ways of, of doing private sector things which are perhaps uh, better if governed by social values. And, there's a, and that means things like uh, cooperatives, a lot of fair trade stuff. Um, I, uh, I subscribe to something called the Phone Cooperative. I don't give my money to any of the more um, uh, high-profile phone companies. So I give money to a phone cooperative. Do you remember that? No. Phone cooperative? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> and, uh, and Bank Would Try Us Bank, as an example. Ethical bankers now coming more on the scene. Um, uh, phone companies that invest their, um, their profits into, uh, um, into community good. And this morning we were in, uh, in South Shields where they're talking about launching at last uh, a social enterprise stationary company, so we can kiss Viking goodbye. Thank goodness. Um, how am I doing? Can I, I've got, a, got three minutes. Three minutes. Right. Very quick. Though. This, this is a, uh, a main point. Then uh, art for, for me has been a real integral part of, uh, of working in social enterprise. Of course, there's about creating new business and all the cultural and media stuff that we use to do that. Um, one of the things that we really struggle with in, in social enterprise and, and in all our work is not consultation. Consultation to me is, it, I get irritated with it. It's trying to create this sort of, what poshly called stakeholder dialogue. But what I mean is, is that we want a conversation, an equal conversation between the people we're trying to help or the beneficiaries and the people who we're trying to serve. And, and what uh, we say, particularly when we're working with enterprises and organizations, don't, for goodness sake, get a big group of people to go out with questionnaires. If you want to get people involved, get them in, use, a, use a community artist. Go and, go and recruit an, an artist and ask them and say, there's a group of people there who we want to talk to, and they, we want them to talk to us. How do we get that process going? And there's quite a few examples of where community artists have been used in this process of dialogue. Building confidence, of course, is, is important, and I get really frustrated that so often they don't meet. You have community arts projects, they build people's confidence, and then there it goes in the air. Places like uh, Brusa in Sweden is a fantastic example where community artists build the confidence and then help regenerate a village. And those linkages aren't there. Um, and the other thing, which I'm not quite sure how to explain really, but uh, I think a lot of the work in social enterprise is about us saying, we don't accept that enterprise should be about, um, about making money or power or, 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 or a healthy balance sheet. It's about something else. It's about empowerment. It's about people developing. And in there, we find, I think, a, a common body in, in, in dealing with, with art and culture. That I think your values 
are really important and the values that came out in that, uh, in, in your thing, it's, it's a different values and I think that's in a really important role. And I've got three more slides that I'll go through in 10 seconds okay. each. Right. Uh, the next one really is, is just a bit of work um, we've been doing in Newcastle. We've done a, um, a long study there, but it just shows you the, the fact that in places like Newcastle, social enterprise, huge underachievement, loads of capacity, lots of things to do from schools, procurement, uh, asset building, and challenging the, uh, the private sector. So there's a lot, there's a huge potential in social enterprise in every sort of uh, um, area. And the next one, uh, particularly challenging the local, because what I think we're talking about is a, is a sector convergence. I quite welcome the, uh, um, this on both sides. One is that I do think that from the voluntary sector, which I've been involved in, <coughs> we have to move away from perhaps more of the charitable, Victorian values, where they said, in, into things which are more sort of social enterprise driven by social objectives. But also we've got to put pressure on the private sector, move them into social, more corporate social responsibility or providing alternatives. So I think there's a, there's a large sector convergence going in, which we're all, I think, part of. And finally, I'm going to end up with an advert. You can just book. I uh, couldn't help it, but yes. Uh, we've got a conference us, uh, ourselves coming up in September the 7th in Newcastle, in James's Park. Uh, and we're looking at some of these things uh, social auditing, corporate responsibility, social licenses. So that's the advert, and that's the end. And I do know it in 10 minutes. Yes, yes. yes. Thank you very much, Blake, for that. Thanks. Thank you, James.
the, the grant scheme itself, um, cultural business venture, we always call it CBV, um, Le Le Leicester City. It's been running since 1999, and we have current funding until the end of this financial year. It's the role of the Creative Industries Officer to start discussions with our funding um, partners as to how we can continue post-2006. Through working with the Creative Industries, it's given us, um, as Regional Office, very strong regional awareness of what a Creative Industry is, what, it, what the needs are, um, and then we've, we've been able to gain that by working with Creative Industries themselves, but also in partnership working and through networking around the region. Ruben's already touched upon the work of, and, uh, of Richard Florida, and um, we're, look, we're looking at the support that we can give through and make an economic impact um, to, to, to the region. Through the research that's taken place and the evaluation of, of the scheme to date, it is making a difference, but we appreciate there's a lot more work that can be done to make things a lot better. The scheme's business focused rather than art form development focused, so again, that's a difference that we, we debate in our office from time to time as well. We accept applications from new startups and mature businesses. We work in partnership with the Prince's Trust in the region. So if it's a pre-start business and the applicant would be under 31, then initially we would be, they would be referred to the Prince's Trust. Post three months trading, no matter what age you are, you can speak to the Arts Council Office Direct. And the, the, we're looking at supporting privately owned, full-time commercial creative industries. The businesses that we support, it takes them onto the next step of their development and that can be increased capacity or it can be opening up new opportunities or indeed they just need, they can respond better to existing opportunities. Since, 2000, since 2001, Arts Council have been able to invest 1.7 million of grant support to the creative industries. And I, I'll, I've got some more figures to give you but um, I'll make it quite clear whether it's Arts Council only support or whether it's Prince's Trust and Arts Council support as I go through. It's an access to microfinance scheme and it's a minimum of £1,000 support, maximum of £10,000 support. The current scheme is funded through some European money, single programme money from the Regional Development Agency and that's why it's the business development focused as opposed to the art form. They want to know jobs, jobs created, jobs safeguarded, what difference is it making to the economy. We can spot to 75% of total project costs. So for example, if a project cost, if project cost came to £12,000, an applicant could ask us for a maximum of £8,000 and we'd look for the applicant to put forward 25% of match. And that can be made up in different, different ways. We, we list those ways in the, in the guidelines, we make that quite clear. Um, I've t told you about the new starts or existing businesses and eligible project costs, predominantly capital, but there is an element of revenue. So, um, for example, capital items, equipment, mark but the revenue can include marketing, advertising costs as well, because that can be equally as important to the, the business as having the right piece of equipment. You can apply if you're a creative business, and what we're looking at is we're looking at the um, original the original creation or content of what, of what you do, what's your product or service. You need to be based in the North East, have, a, have or will have a business bank account um, before an award could be paid across to you, employ or will employ less than 35 members of staff, have an annual turnover of less than £100,000. Now that's a point of application. If that's going to go above £100,000 then and that's what you want in, then that's fine. And you need to have sought and received appropriate business advice. And this is where we've tried to build up relationships with the business support network in the region. So for example, in Tees Valley, we've been working with Business Link, um, where we get applications come through from people who've had that advice through InBiz, um, and more region-wide, Entrust or Project North East, um, for a lot of the Newcastle, China Wee based businesses. Um, I'll just quickly run through these. Um, if anybody would like um, more information, the full application pack is on the Arts Council website. Um, and, um, but we're quite happy to, to mail out, and I'll give you our info um, later this afternoon, so if anybody wants to, to talk to me about that. So as you can see, various things that we can support. 
sometimes, probably most of the time, it's equally as important as what we can't fund as what we can. So unfortunately we can't support staffing costs, training costs, any existing loans or repayments that need to be, to be made. What we ask for as well as an application form is a comprehensive and up-to-date business plan and that's where the relationships with the business support network is coming very um, useful. We're not business advisors, we can talk to you about the scheme and the process but we make it quite clear that you need to speak to the people who, who do this as, well, as their day job to get the best advice. If you're an existing business, we'd ask for a copy of your latest annual accounts. They don't have to be audited, it could be your monthly management accounts. Cash three are cash flow forecast. Again, appreciating you don't have a crystal ball, we don't, but we ask people to take <coughs> a common sense, realistic approach. The two main things that the assessor will look at is your business plan and your cash flow forecast. What they're looking for is that you've got a sustainable business and it's going to be fine, it looks like it's going to be financially viable. And to be honest, the unsuccessful applications more often than not um, aren't successful because at the time of application, financial viability hasn't been demonstrated. We ask for quoting estimates from third party suppliers and confirmation of business advice or training. shown that the strong links with the business support networks make it work better. The partnership working with the business support networks, but in particular the Prince's Trust, um, what they do is they, we give them a, a section of our money and they use it as grant to match it against their low interest rate loan scheme. That then once, even if you support through the Prince's Trust, it doesn't stop you from coming back to the Arts Council for additional, additional support. We have creative industries officer in, in the region and they've got knowledge and understanding of the sector need. But again, it's not just in isolation. We work with other regional agencies, local agencies, who also work with the creative industries to, to add value to that. And there was a demand for it. Um, a lot of creative industries just find it difficult to access mainstream funding and or support. Um, the, um, Two business links um, in particular at the moment uh, that we've been working with are Business Link Tyne and Weir. And two days a week, we have an embedded business advisor with creative industry specialism. The agreement is they're employed by Business Link, they're not employed by the Arts Council. And it's an agreement between Arts Council, Business Link, and Northern Film and Media that um, we, we share the advisor. They're pretty much out and about meeting clients, so we don't, we don't see them very often. It's a guy called Paul Crozier. The, agree the agreement is that if a business isn't based in Tyne Weir, Paul will still talk to them and he will use his contacts, his, his contacts with other sub-regional business links to refer that person on to the appropriate, sub appropriate sub-regional office, but also delivering a grant scheme. Figures with, between the Princess Trust and Arts Council since 1999, we've been able to assist over 400 businesses, create create um, 295 jobs, or they were projected to be created through the support. Over 286 jobs have been safeguarded, and again, that's the, the figure for the Arts Council support. It's a competitive scheme, so um, some businesses, some applicant, applicants are successful, unfortunately others aren't. There is an opportunity to be, um, to reapply, and we're quite happy to give detailed feedback, looking at strengths and weaknesses of applications against our assessment criteria. The impact, the impact is viewed on what it did for the business and through evaluation that we've um, commissioned, the businesses have told us it's helped them raise their profile and that's mainly been through new marketing materials and website development, and give them the right image when they're going out to um, pitch for business. It's increased their professionalism and again that's through the marketing materials and also new equipment. It, the new equipment in particular has seen a step change in how the business operates and it's, in their eyes, it made them feel more credible to potential and existing clients. The opening of new, new art form possibilities, um, it's enabled um, some of the businesses to create bigger and better pieces 
of work and to work on more ambitious projects that without certain bits of equipment they wouldn't be able to do. The upcoming business block fits in with working with a business advisor. A lot of the businesses have never considered talking to a business advisor and um, they've been able to develop their key business principles, looking at even looking at business planning, what a cash flow forecast looks like. And collaborating with new partners, that's been mainly through the um, other aid business support agencies with sector specific, such as CodeWorks, which in the Tees Valley, and um, new uh, <coughs> in the North, them as well, but um, also Northern Film and Media, <coughs> the writers, script writers, and film producers. What might be more of interest is um, what CBB has done in Tees Valley. Since October 2001, in total we've had 505 applications to the scheme. We've had 90 from Tees Valley. Tyne and Weir dominate the market. 57% um, came from Tyne and Weir. So, you know, we're quite, <coughs> we've got media coverage, so we're quite happy and more than willing to accept applications from creative industries in the Tees Valley. Um, the contested businesses have been able to support graphic designers, software developers, photographers, galleries, crafts, fine artists. <coughs> Majority have been new businesses and for us that means businesses who are either new, new starts or they've been training for less than 12 months. <coughs> so that leaves 24% being existing businesses. And we've supported businesses who've been, who start up to businesses who've been trading for um, 23 to 32 years. So, you know, cross sector of, of from the age of a business. Typical business profile, male, sole trader, working from home, not that registered, <coughs> turnover of 10 to 50,000 pounds for existing businesses, and they're looking to work, their work's predominantly in the Northeast and across the UK. Out of the 90 applications, we've had 40 successful awards. That works out to 44%, and that's about the average of successful awards for the whole programme. We've been able to make an investment of just under a quarter of a million pounds. Average request is just under six and a half thousand pounds, but it doesn't mean that you have to make that average request. If you need to ask us for 10,000 pounds worth of support, then do so. You just need to clarify and justify that in your application. Average award is just, average award is, award, it's just less than the six and a half thousand. <coughs> and these two numbers it just worked out that they're the same. 48 jobs have been safeguarded and 48 jobs have been created or projected to have been created. I think that's, that's about yeah. The last slide is just the contact details for the creative industries officer. Uh, he joined us in, in August. Can I just say very quickly? Yes. The person <coughs> who, um, was his predecessor, Mark Adamson. He left us in, at the end of March to join One North East as their creative industry specialist advisor. So we've got a friend in the camp um, for when we need to go back and renego renegotiate what future funding we can have from them. Thanks very much, Lisa. Um, just to say that you know, I'm going to try and quickly go through as a very, very positive thing and it's helped us to get better access into, the, into that overall fund because, uh, as, as we get somebody able to provide that being funded through mainstream business support funding, not through any sort of cultural funding. So that again is quite important to embedding that in the business support sort of community. <coughs> Just going on now further, um, the next uh, speaker is Mike Young, who is chair of Sigma and Social Enterprise Board of the Head of the Development Trust. Could you use the microphone, sorry. please? Yes, sorry, I, I'm sorry about that. I thought you were too good. And so the next speaker is, um, is Mike Young, chair of Sigma and the Social Enterprise Coordinator of the Head of the Development Trust. Um, Cliff in his presentation was talking about the importance of social enterprises in building confidence. One of the key things which uh, which um, which uh, social enterprises can do is raise aspirations of young people. And here's a good example of one such scheme that works. So Mike, over to you. Okay, we just we do actually need to wait for the technology unfortunately. I'm sorry if that causes any problems, but there's there's, there's very uh, good evidence uh, of, of how social enterprise uh, uh, actually happens with young people and how it starts with young people. So I'm really keen for the for the presentation to actually start, but I might like get the feeling that it's going well. It will get there. Just to what I'll do is then I'll start with a, a discussion about Headland Development Trust itself, uh, just to give you a background of what Headland Development Trust does. 
Uh, Headland Development Trust very much is involved in community development, it's very much involved uh, in bringing people uh, out of themselves and, and looking to them and their skills. And some of the ways that, that, that it's done that is, is to promote this idea that, uh, of social and economic regeneration, uh, but by building capacity in people. So what it's very much done is looked at individuals, uh, given them opportunities, but also given them opportunities to come into meetings and to start the steering groups um, and, and to, to really develop the ideas themselves of where, them see, where they see themselves. So it's it planning themselves as well. Uh, it crosses um, age boundaries. It's, it's from early years right through to, to, to senior citizens. Uh, and uh, what we've seen is, is things like uh, uh, art craft, art craft uh, sessions start. Uh, we've seen um, the Youth Battery uh, Trust developed, uh, which is uh, be a brilliant uh, uh, tourism attraction on, on the headland in Hartlepool uh, for, for years to come. Uh, and that's had massive investment. It's become a trust of its own now. So you know, with the support of Headland Development Trust, it's, it's come through, come through that. Uh, Looks like we're getting somewhere. Um, and uh, we've also seen, uh, obviously, the headland itself is flanked on three sides by water. Uh, so it's, it's, it's good to see that we've got a Chartered Skippers Association as well that, that are being supported through, through Headland Development Trust. But all these community groups that may be small, but they're all uh, representational residents in the area, uh, and most of them uh, are fairly keen to see uh, change happen uh, and uh, are being invested in, which is, which is an important, important aspect. The organisation itself at the moment uh, has, has uh, developed uh, into divisions and uh, one of those divisions is culture and leisure which is what we're going to focus on today. Uh, the other one uh, is, is community initiatives and the third one is, is education and learning. Um, the culture and leisure element ha has two projects. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Sigma Culture and Leisure, which used to be called Sigma Arts and Media, um, and the second side of that is, is Scrum, which is, if I get it right, Sporting Communities Rugby Union Museum, uh, which is a, a group of uh, gentlemen uh, and some ladies, I believe, who decided that the heritage of, of Rugby Union was, was so important that they should set up an exhibition about it, and they have a, 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 an exhibition set up about into rugby myself. So some of the information that I've learned from, from that project has been uh, fantastic, especially the bit that says that the, the All Blacks actually played on Fryridge Field on the headland. Uh, so that was uh, a good piece of information to, to know. Um, community initiatives, uh, the Active, Health, uh, sorry, Active Aid Healthy Lifestyles project uh, looks at all aspects of health and, and bringing uh, people into that. Uh, we have things like uh, uh, Tai Chi, Tai Bo, um, we have uh, other more uh, gentle exercise programs. We also have, a, 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 in one of our community venues, uh, a fitness suite that was only uh, transported over last week. So that's another thing that's gonna be, gonna be used. And it's also things like lifestyle in terms of healthy eating, etc. cetera. Um, it, it probably would be a good thing to, to, to say that uh, in, in terms of the Activate Healthy Lifestyle project, it is invested heavily by, by Saturday Sector and the PCT uh, are uh, investing quite heavily into that project. Um, the other aspect is obviously community development. I've mentioned the Up Battery Trust, and I've also mentioned uh, the uh, Charter Skippers Association, and uh, they are uh, both from the community development uh, side of things. And the, uh, as, it, as it is being termed now, education and learning, um, which involves a, a community learning, uh, sorry, community legal learning program, uh, and other courses which come from from the other divisions. Down to Sigma. Here we go. <laughs> While we're here. Oh, it's okay, don't, 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 don't know, click it, it's, oh, yeah, you need to go back in, sorry, yeah. yeah. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> if you just go to slide four, uh, sorry, slide three, and then just press slide show, it should, uh, it should that's all right. You get, you get a sneak preview of what the photos look like. Can you remind people where the headland is? Oh, you want to know where, does anybody know where the headland is? All right, it's in Hartlepool, there you go, all right. Right, okay, well there you go. The headland is in Hartlepool. I thought everybody knew where the headland was, I must admit. <laughs> That's all right. I 
thought I was going to it. Um, the, the aim of, of Sigma originally was to uh, encourage people to learn new skills uh, through the production or, of a product or development of a skill, uh, uh, something that's tangible to them, something that they can really focus on and, and be encouraged in uh, and, and to be empowered in to, to, to participate in. Um, and, and it would be something that they would uh, then maximize themselves to gain their own potential so they would see their own potential in it. Uh, it just so happened that uh, uh, the arts was a key area that young people were looking at, and uh, uh, Sigma part, uh, partnered on, on uh, has partnered and continues to partner uh, on, on various projects with Tees Valley Arts uh, to, to do that. The objective is is to promote vocational skills based training with the ultimate aim of sustaining employability for life. Now, the, the 21st century skills white paper came out and with, and with a bang sort of wiped out the, the whole concept of jobs for life. So it's very important that when we look at uh, young people, we're encouraging them. Uh, to develop lots of different skills to, to promote employability for life uh, and in that you, you, you create skills rich societies instead of skills poor societies. The program itself, um, as you'll see from the photographs, includes things like circus skills, stilt walking, prop design, theatre makeup, costume design, radio broadcasting, uh, cabaret lights, <coughs> filmmaking, songwriting, creative writing, cartoon drawing and animation. One of the key things I want to look at um, is the radio uh, broadcasting aspect. That is currently going through the process uh, at uh, what was Trotten, is now just uh, the, the Open Cause Network. Um, and they are looking to, uh, to, to, to accredit that. So that's another, another way that we can give young people uh, some investment and, and, and create some social capital there. One of the key aspects of, of, of the work that, that, that Sigma does is the engagement of young people. It's so difficult these days to give young people something that they don't already have um, and uh, something that they can be enthusiastic about. So one of the things that the, the, the Sigma does is very much give the ownership over to young people. As soon as they walk into a, a, a programme, they're encouraged to, to develop their own ideas, to take it in the direction that they wanted to go in. Um, and they themselves, they get something out of that, pro out of that process. Um, they, they can join steering committees, they can, you know, they can, they can do all sorts of things to, to help develop the programmes of work. And that in itself is, is, is a way of building self-esteem, it's a way of building self-confidence in young people, and then young people come out and, and uh, have gained not just educational experience through their skills, but the experience of life, uh, which is to sit down with people, as we've already mentioned, to have conversations, and to, and to really build on those communication skills that are there. It's also important to recognise that we're talking about social regeneration as well, and, and social regeneration has a knock-on effect to economic regeneration. If you're creating uh, individuals who are, uh, or, or helping develop your individuals that are, that are self-confident, that are, that are um, looking to, to, to develop their own skills and, and, and develop their own confidence, then that's an investment in our own future. Uh, these, these young people are going to be, uh, in one way or another, looking after us in the future. So when I'm growing old, I'd like to know that we've invested uh, in young people at the, at, the earliest, at the earliest stage in order to, 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 to safeguard that. I think that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Um, I think we've got some interesting uh, examples from our speakers. We started off with uh, Tracy talking about sort of a different approach to dealing with sort of art into landscape and community environments, working for community, but working with engineers and taking, looking at the importance of art in that and looking at different funding mechanisms as well for doing that and showing commitment. Um, Ruba talking about um, the importance of arts and strategic planning, the need to provide evidence space to justify the important role of culture and regeneration. Uh, Cliff was talking about social enterprises, about creating stakeholder dialogue, about uh, an equal, equal relationship also with, um, not, not, with also the, the customers as well as the stakeholders, and the importance of social enterprises and building confidence. And in the example, Mike, he showed that very well about how social enterprises can operate in arts and culture and raise the aspirations of young people. And then Elisa talked about very much the funding of creative uh, industries and looking at that on a more sort of traditional, sort of um, business-like sort of footing. Um, is there any questions that people would like to, uh, like to ask or any points people would like to make? It's over to you for the next 20 minutes of the debate. Shall I start with one question while I get you thinking? Oh, there's one at the back in the seat, sorry, yes. We actually didn't applaud Ruben because of something that happened at that point. I'm very conscious that we haven't done that, oh, so I'd just like to applaud Ruben's well, point. Thank you, but I'm not, good. so don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Any uh, 
I was going to make the pick up on something that uh, you, the point you've made, John, in relation to Lisa's uh, uh, description of the, uh, the the cultural business venture and the, and the investment in uh, mainstream business support, mainstream business support for the cultural industries. Um, it, whilst there is a tendency for us to, by necessity, describe things as businesses which the people involved in it don't see as businesses, um, one of the things which we've got to do as a sector is get our hands on the mainstream resources that are available to, su to support the growth of industries. And cultural industries lose out. If you take, a, if you take the percentage uh, uh, growth of cultural businesses across the, the nation, then we, we do very poorly as a region and we do very poorly as a sub-region in relation to the region. We've got latent capacity for growth in cultural businesses. We've got a mainstream business support sector and a brokerage model which says, well, if you come to us for support, uh, we'll signpost the people who can help you out. The trouble is, um, the people signposting don't understand exactly what the characteristics and needs are of cultural businesses, and the cultural businesses don't understand the language of the agencies who are doing the signposting. And so what you get is a situation in which the, the, the latent potential, and, and anybody who, suggest, who suggests to me that the people of the Tees Valley have any, an inherently lower capacity to create new business innovation than anybody else elsewhere in the country I would challenge. So that latent potential is not being realised because of a failure of the mainstream services and the failure of the cultural sector to meet in the middle. And one of the things which we've been doing with Tees Valley Business Link, uh, with the support of the Cultural Business Venture and with buy-in from Tees Valley Partnership, and from the Joint Strategy Unit, is trying to create the language, to try to create the mid-ground, trying to create the understanding on both sides of the divide of, uh, uh, of, of, what is, of what they have to offer to one another. And I think it really is, um, if we're looking at regeneration, that's illustrative of a wider need, which is that if you're playing a part of regeneration as a cultural business, it might not be the main reason you're doing it. Regeneration per se might not be why you're in it, but understanding what the regenerative outputs and outcomes are of the sort of things that you can do is critical to gaining you the opportunity. A couple of weeks ago, um, I, I had to interview um, the new director for adult community services uh, for Hartlepool Council. There were five people all up for the job, um, and as a stakeholder based in Hartlepool, I was asked to be part of the interview panel. This was a preview interview panel. None of the people actually heard of Creative Industries. Um, uh, they'd be running libraries, art, uh, art galleries, you know, I, I think the whole list. They never heard of it. That was my question. Um, it would be quite good at the Arts Council Northeast to get in contact with the new director, which will be Nicola Bailey. Uh, she's starting in January, um, and actually give her some information about creative industries. Sorry, where would she be based? In Hartlepool. She should be the director of adult community services. Um, yes. So in terms of trying to get information across, yeah. you're, you're, you're going to have a director. Um, that's not her creative industry. Yeah, right, thank you. Um, sorry, another question. Um, during the course of this, this summer, I had a long conversation with somebody, an American guy, who specializes in the history of technology. And I said, one of the things that, that he needs to do is actually come to England, because we began the Industrial Revolution, and we are now the first to run down the Industrial Revolution, and we're actually moving into a totally new area, um, which is that you are covering it. Um, as I said, he deals with the history of technology, and I said, well, you, you, you need to come here for the future, because we are the first people um, to start the Industrial Revolution, and we're the first, first people um, to, to deal with the aftermath of that Industrial Re Revolution. Any other points, questions? Yes. I just want to have a bit of a wine, really. All right. <laughs> Just to say that my experience as an artist and as an arts worker, however grand the vision, and we all have those grand visions, is that I still spend most of my working days scrabbling around for funding. And it's a very insecure business, and I think it's fantastic that um, I've attended a few events recently where I've been told how, you know, quotes my 
input as a creative person is so valuable and fantastic and brilliant. Why doesn't somebody pay me more then? And pay me more sustainably? And not just pay me for a year? Really? Just a bit of a whine. I'm, I'm, <laughs> there is no answer, but you yeah, know, well, there just is, to say. There, there, there is, Rena, and that's congratulations, you've made it. Because that's exactly the same for us. You know, we spend all our time scrabbling around for money. We, we, you know, that's the system. We all spend our time defining what it is we want to achieve, persuading people that that's valuable, and trying to get somebody to pay for it. And and if, and if that's what your experience as an artist is, then I'm, you know, congratulations, you have made it. <laughs> Thank you, Ruben. You're a comfort. Uh, uh, just, <laughs> can, I, can I just also say that I, that, that I think that what Rena said is is, uh, is a major problem. And I think that there's a major problem about the way in which funds are administered. I think there's a major way in which uh, the criteria for them are set. And one of the things that I was glad to hear, uh, a phrase being coined by our sector, I think we should all um, talk about it, is the high transactional costs of funding. Uh, and uh, there's been a, a recent report, I think, that uh, has been going around Brussels, which is saying that too many projects are spending too much of their time in transactional costs working for the funder and not for the beneficiaries. And I think that's a big problem that has to be addressed. Yes, not least on the European funders. Yes. <laughs> that makes sense, sir. <laughs> Which is about the most esoteric of all to, to access. Yes, sir. Can you, people hear me? Um, one thing I was actually particularly pleased to hear was actually your emphasis on the impact of the physical environment um, in the work that was done in London, rather than just the arts, because what you did was actually made the arts something rather than separate. I mean, I, I would be interested to see how the people of the Tees Valley would see that would be, would, how their take would be different on that. Because I, I, you know, we, we live in quite a, an area which has got a lot under the surface. People see the industry, but we've got some fantastically beautiful areas here. We've got a lot of nature and so on. I'd love to see something in the Tees Valley very similar to that. That that is really exciting. So thank you. Um, just to, I, did, I didn't say very much about Bunkley and Dagenham, but it is a community built up out, out of the office still of East London. Um, in Dagenham, the Beckentry Estate was the first social housing project ever built in the country, and as a result, it was actually monitored for several years to see how these communities could actually function, how they work together in social housing. Uh, everybody had within walking distance a library and a shop and, and so on. But then also with the huge industrial, uh, you know, your point about industry, um, and also just kind of recapping on what other people have said, those sort of projects work because they don't happen in isolation. There is that issue, it has to be underpinned by arts development, it has to be underpinned by an ongoing sustainable programme of arts that people can access at all sorts of intellectual levels, and all sorts of physical levels, I mean, which we, think we okay, also that currently in Middlesbrough we've got this thing called Lima coming up, you know, um, and there's been a lot of debate. I mean, I work with health and social care groups about how really relevant is it going to be to their lives. You know, is this just like a glass tower, Eiffel Tower, glass Eiffel Tower for the arts, you know, to raise its profile, or is this going to be something people will really engage with? What you showed us today was something that was, improves people's lives, was artistic, and was actually relevant. Uh, I'd and love to say I would much rather see that than No, I would love to say absolutely totally was. But yeah. over the years it hasn't always been perceived as that. And I'd be completely honest yeah. about that. Yeah. Because we, during the course of the project, the first project that was completed in that whole scheme was the roundabout with blue lights on it. Yeah. Loads of publicity, the biggest public art project, massive millions of pounds funding public art and a huge road improvement scheme with hoardings all along, it's in coming soon landscape, and hours and hours of backlog of traffic, and the local community, I started the job, to this whole backlog of emails saying, what the hell is this? Disgusting, <laughs> disgraceful, waste of money, etc., etc. And it's been four and a half years of constant communication and about events and engaging people and humanizing artists as well, actually having things like a marquee where someone walks in and they're really angry because you're spending their money on some art and their school's not very good, and introducing them to a human being who has hopes, aspirations, and the issue about, you know, not being paid and supported. I mean, it, it's a lot, I meet artists who do not see that they have any relationship with the public, and I see artists who feel that 
if they are working in the public sector, then that's their role jumps and there's accountability. And not all artists can work within the public sector. Not all artists should be publicly funded. Uh, you know, it, it's a real issue. Though, when I said about community arts being the avant-garde, I'm really serious about that because we always hear about these fantastic artists who are the avant-garde, but they're so tasked with the establishment. Everyone loves them. They hundreds of thousands of pounds they work. They're in all the galleries. They're, they're the least avant-garde of the arts world. You know. I think my point is that it's relevant because it's much more relevant to people who might like it. There are, there, are, there are plenty of projects, of course, in the Tees Valley that, 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 are, that are of similar ilk. And, and in fact, Tees Valley Arts has been, for many years, championing and managing public art projects which yeah. have engaged communities. Um, yeah. But I think what's interesting about the, the, the uh, experience of marking is that uh, it's is basically sort of it's using art in a professional context of engineers and landscape architects and urban designers. I mean, I think one of the things which there's a tendency, if, if you think of doing things around here, is that we, we just put people into boxes like that. I don't think of an art applying artist plans into those sorts of things. And I think the lesson from that is that maybe there is a role for art to work with the, you know, the people in the local farms who are doing that type of work, or the local regeneration companies, to, to try and do something a bit more advantage. I mean, there is a history in, I used to work in London, and uh, you know, one of the good things about doing road schemes in London was that you know you, you had a nice bridge somewhere. Someone would actually at least think of putting a decent architect to do a nice bridge. I mean, I spent a lot of time on a, the bridge over the North Circular Road at Twyford <coughs> near Park Royal, which is, I have to say, is a design which I personally approve. So whether you like it or not, it's something which um, you may or may not like. But but that is there's much more of a willingness to do that in London. I think because there tends to be a more sort of understanding around. We have we have things in Tisa, for example, the Bottle of Notes. Yes. You know, the bottle of notes is immensely sorry. The bottle of notes is immensely popular um, with people. That outside the law courts, there's the statue of the kids fighting in Hell Park. We can, you know, and should be looking at generating the capacity of the T side to bring our own art, art and culture through. But yes, do it in a way that, that improves people's lives. I personally feel that's the way forward. I also think it's important in that point that this sense that you know you bring the artist in because yeah. the artist is one who brings creative thinking, but actually the whole team can yeah. think creatively. Yes. And there's so many people working in local authority uh, who are so institutionalised and inhibited, yeah. but come from a very creative background. Engineers are creative designers. That's how they became engineers. And you know I meet artists who say, well, you know, you don't understand if you were an artist like me, but. I don't want to hear that. You know, it, it's problematic. I want to understand that we've got very different skills all as part of the yeah. team. And that's how we work. And I think one thing I would say about Bath and Dagenham is putting a civil engineer on the arts team and then lighting designers and artists all working as one single team to achieve one single aim was a really successful example of, of good practice. Load, load the trumpet for Barking and Dagenham. Anyone? Can I ask you a question? Yes, I was wondering if um, uh, the projects that you've been involved in, the various kind of regeneration um, projects that you've been I was wondering about the various re regeneration projects you've been involved in. Um, was there any evaluation or research inherent in the planning of the expenditure? And, and uh, is it longitudinal? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm sure we've all been. We, we, I, I said in my um, brief talk uh, presentation that I thought that uh, evidence was was critical and evaluation uh, it, it, based on the evidence and, and evaluating activity as you go along in order to, to generate evidence as to what's being effective um, is absolutely crucial. And there are plenty of examples of, of regeneration schemes where its impact on communities, its impact on the economics of an area, its impact on crime, its impact on um, all sorts of different things have been evaluated. In the classic examples in, in health, where, where you know changes of the, of the environment of healthcare uh, have been evaluated in terms of their, you know, their contribution to to people's sense of well-being and to and to recovery rates and so on. So there's lots of evaluation of regeneration schemes. It's patchy. I think there are, there are two issues. One is about you know the quantifiable, you know, qualitative versus quantitative argument. Um, anecdotal evidence is in the main in terms of talking about people who use subways and how they feel about it. Uh, the
those sorts of things are long-term evaluations. And we're commissioning an evaluation of the A13 Art Skip Scheme because I think we need some objectivity in it uh, to really look at our commissioning practices as well as people's reaction to it. Uh, the whole management of the project and the whole financial accountability of it, all those things inform Bath and Rimside, for example, is the biggest brownfield development project in Europe at the moment, biggest regeneration project. If we are going to use those principles as in Artscape for those areas, we, we've got to be confident that you know, they work in the long term. Um, but the whole premise in which you even get the funding, and it is a constant argument to get funding, um, I have to raise 500% of my budget in order to deliver what the council expects as a standard arts development programme, which is you know, offensive to me. But the real issue is that we have to demonstrate that there is a local need for it. And it, it does involve lots of consultation, and it does involve some box ticking, and it does involve some you know, court and you know, some loosely termed uh, demand, shall we say. But you have to make a persuasive argument for the arts and culture. And if you don't make that persuasive argument, you just won't get any money. And you know, we, we lose out all the time. Councilman over there, I think it's hand up. Yes, sir. Yeah, there's a question for Lisa. We've got any cook there, the creative the business mentions. And um, you mentioned the Tees, Tees, Tees Valley had an uptake of about 18%. Yeah. And the tide side, something like 16%. Is that mainly because of a lack of applications from Tees Valley? Um, yeah, yeah, the majority of applications come from Tyne and Wales. Yeah. Yeah. So you welcome more from this area? Yeah. And that's another thing we're trying to address with this, with this post for business later, which is what we said. But as we said, that, sorry, as we said, that, 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 that it's not, that's not exclusive to CBP. No. The level of take up of any grant regime of the Arts Council, or in fact of any of the other regional grant givers, is lower per capita for the Tees Valley than, than, it, than it should be on, an, on, on, an, on an equal take up basis. And it is about rates of application rather than success rates being low. I can take one more question, and then we, we close. If that, so sorry, so that, that's Mr. Jane over here. Hi, my name is Hannah Campion. I'm a practicing artist and I'm also working at Miles Moon Gallery in Darlington. Um, through receiving support from the Prince's Trust and the Arts Council, I've um, basically been led into discussions with Arthur M Mitchell from the Prince's Trust and Catherine Bertola from AM Magazine. And through those discussions, it seems to be the general consensus with the focus groups and things that there's a lack of knowledge and understanding from people like myself as a fine artist of actually where to go for support, funding, you know, to find out about workshops, um, if you want to volunteer for different organisations. And it is actually pretty daunting to go and find out about these things. Um, I did eventually get there through Business Link and things, but speaking to different artists, I, I don't know if anyone had any advice or, or help really that I could offer to other people. I think what, one, of the, one of the things that we're, we're looking to do is um, talk to the um, FE, FE and AG, um, establishments to see um, what we can do to educate about what it, what it is entailed in being a business once you, once you leave that academic environment. So that's one thing that we can, we can do. I mean, I've been at well, Northern Arts in the Arts Council for three and a half years, and you, we get up and coming graduates who actually didn't know Northern Arts existed or the Arts Council exist and what it is we do. So yeah, we've got a piece of PR to do, I guess, um, to, to help with that situation. It's also worth um, people bearing in mind that all of the local authorities in the area, um, in the Tees Valley, and it used to be it used to be true of the region as a whole, every single local authority has an arts, de arts development function, has a, a, a professional arts expertise which can help guide and signpost for, 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 for artists. I think also uh, it's worth contacting the Council's economic development team as well as the arts team. Um, quite often, I mean one of our best kept secrets is that we're developing artist studios and I say it's the best kept secret because we've tried not to promote it too much because we've been in major dispute with developers for several years which we're only now just resolving and part of getting support in order to do the building we have to demonstrate that we are somehow supporting artists to have those networks, to find ways of 
uh, exhibiting or having workspace or to, to get commissioned and to how big thing is and it seems so simple having just finished like a degree degree or a master's you think it'd be so obvious but one of the things that I see artists not do terribly well time and time again is present to a client that's come from you know like a construction background and to really sell themselves and I see predominantly you know the young techie men getting the commissions because they seem safer so that's one of the things we're trying to do as well as part of that business support for artists is how to put together your portfolio and present and it means treating carefully because you, you, you're dealing with people whose portfolio is is everything about them and straight and it's not presented well it's like saying to someone you're not dressed very well so you know it, it's something that we we have to be more sensitive as well but it, 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 it's a long time coming thank you Thank you very much. Would, would you take, um, would you would you please, in the normal way, thank our panel for their presentations, which they've done so well in such difficult circumstances. <laughs> and thank you to the audience for your very interesting questions. Thank you very much indeed. Uh,